Thank you so much, and I can't even go and hug the girl because it's yellow. Good. All right, guys, okay. Oh. Is it good? Okay. All right. Welcome. Can you hear me? Okay, it's on. Good. Hi, welcome. Um, I am Janet Haven. I am the executive director of Data and Society. Welcome to our 111th. Data Byte. Thank you very much. Bex pointed out that it's a binary. <laughs> um, so um, if you're here for the first time, uh, Data Bytes is our, is our sort of monthly, more than monthly speaker series. Um, June is our special month in Data Bytes because our uh, annual class of fellows gives talks every week in June. So this is the second of our Fellows Data Byte series um, with Bex Hurwitz and Mari Bostashevsky, um, who we're delighted to have here. Um, how many of you have been to Data and Society before? Awesome. <laughs> All right. I may not need to run through much of this. <laughs> I, have, I have like a couple of pages that is the, like where everything is. Um, so for, the, for those of you who are new here, uh, Data and Society is an independent nonprofit research institute. We uh, focus on the social and cultural implications of data centric and automated technologies. Um, we do both research and engagement. Um, some of the work that we're focusing on right now involves media manipulation and disinformation, uh, social instabilities in labor futures, um, health, privacy, and data. Um, and the human infrastructures of artificial intelligence. So there, there are a number of different issues that we're working on. That is not all of them, but just to give you a taste of where, um, where our organizational interests lie. Um, there are a number of ways to stay in touch with us here. Uh, we have a mailing list that you can sign up for, and Audrey Evans right there is the person to talk to about getting on the mailing list if you are not Already next week, we will have our final uh, fellows data bite um, of, the, of the year. And we would invite you to come to that as well. That is on Wednesday, June 27th. We're also on Twitter, at Data and Society. Sorry, at Data Society. Um, and the hashtag for this talk is Data Bytes. Um, housekeeping, our bathrooms are two, two lefts to the back, um, if you need it. Um, during the Q&A session after these talks, if you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand and we'll be running around with microphones. Um, we are recording this, so let us know if you don't want to be recorded for any reason. Um, but also that's why we ask you to use the microphone so we can make sure to capture your, your question. Um, if you would like to ask an off-the-record question, we can also do that. Just let us know, uh, let us know ahead of time. Um, so, I'd like to talk very briefly uh, before we go to our talks um, about the fellows program at Data and Society and why we, why we think it is very special and why we make sure to um, ask our fellows to talk about their work at the end of the year. The Data and Society fellows program runs 10 months. It runs from September to June every year. Um, it, is a, it is a core part of our institutional makeup. It is very important to us to bring people through the organization um, to engage with us, and our fellows have been um, artists, journalists, researchers, um, technologists, computer scientists. Um, we've had people from industry join us over the time. There are a number of different kinds of fellows that have joined us, and they have produced all kinds of different work and different types of research. Um, I think one of the things that I, I really love about our fellows program is that it is research-based, but it gives us a way to think about research very broadly, um, and to think about research as an artistic practice, and to think about research as an action-based practice. And I think we'll hear about that from both of our speakers today, um, which is really, which is really, really exciting. Um, so I would like to, I'd like to talk a little bit to introduce um, our two speakers today, and then we will get right to their talks. Um, I'm going to start with Mari Bostashevsky. Um, Mari is an artist, writer, and researcher, as well as a Data and Society Fellow. 
Um, well, while I said most of our fellows join us for 10 months, we were only able to have Mari with us since January of this year. Um, but she has made a huge mark um, on data and society in her, her shorter time here. She's been a fantastic contributor, um, leading small group sessions. She's um, building out her artistic and investigative practices within and around our cohort. And it's been tremendously exciting to have her with us. Um, so Mari's past work has involved counter forensic investigations into emerging forms of power produced by new alliances between states, corporations, and media built around data. Given the dearth of mechanisms for regulating or responding to that power at a global scale, Mari's work delves deeply into the politics of data. Her work is based um, on online and field investigation and is highly image-based. And I can say, having, having had the pleasure of seeing Mari's photography, it is spectacular and beautiful. And I encourage you all to um, look it up. Mari has exhibited and published internationally, including at the Berlin House of Culture, um, the Musée des Elysees, and Art Souterrain. Um, she's held multiple fellowships and residencies from um, Yale to the International Artist Studio in Stockholm. Um, and, and as I said, we feel very lucky to have dragged her over from Europe to the United States for, for a few months. Um, so Mari is gonna be talking today about her research on surveillance, power, and data through the lens of her recent, att recent attempts at making algorithms stumble. Um, and next I'd like to introduce Bex Hurwitz. Um, Bex is an entrepreneur, activist, and community organizer. Um, through practices of co-design, they make media and technology for social justice. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Bex for many, many years and have been inspired by her work. I've learned a tremendous amount um, from them about, uh, about digital security and about the ways in which security and social justice intersect. Uh, Bex co-founded Research Action Design, a worker-owned cooperative that uses uh, community collaborative design of technology and media and secure digital strate strategies to build the power of grassroots social movements. Um, prior to co-founding RAD, Bex was the co-design facilitator and community organizer with the MIT Center for Civic Media. Um, Bex holds degrees in comparative media studies from MIT and in information management and systems from the UC Berkeley iSchool. Um, and as you'll see through her talk, Bex is looking for collaborators in their work, particularly those working on the intersection of governance and the technology industry. Um, and Bex is going to be talking today about transforming digital security into collective power. So I will hand off to to Bex to start us off. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, I'm going to be talking today about transforming digital security into collective power. Um, so I'm going to tell you, um, so lead you towards um, through a story that I've come to to understand based on the work that I do in collaboration with a lot of really amazing activists. Um, I'll tell you a lot of stories about their activism as I go. Um, I just wanted, yeah, just wanted to say it's grounded in the work that I do. So I'm an activist. Um, and to me, what that means is that my work in the world is to design and redesign systems so more and more people can thrive every day. And I'm a techie. So I do my work through, Angie, should I pause? Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm a techie, so that means I do my work in the world through technology, and specifically through um, designing digital security strategies with activists. So what does that mean? Um, well, what is digital security? Uh, if you look at the news media, maybe you think digital security is all about data and your role in the world as a consumer. Um, since the 90s, um, films like The Net have been bringing us concerns about our identity being stolen on the internet and our inability to make credit card transactions. Um, but e even just today, it's still what we're concerned about. This is an ad from the moment um, <clears throat> from Norton Antivirus Software, also trying to make sure that we can continue to make digital financial transactions. But if you're an activist, communication and being online is a matter of survival and it's political. So what does digital security look like if that's what you're doing online? 
Maybe you're Women Cross DMZ, which is a global network of women peace activists organizing for peace and reunification on the Korean Peninsula, using email lists and video conferencing um, to organize your actions. Maybe you're the Global Action Project um, based here in New York, and you're young people making media, teaching other young people how to make movies that tell stories about your own life and to understand media monopolies. So again, this communication is all about survival, telling your own story, and it's political. It's about building power. So digital security in this context shows up and it looks like censor censorship. Maybe it looks like DDoS attacks on your website that take down your website and make it impossible for you to share your own message. Maybe it looks like people targeting your Facebook account and you getting taken down there. Maybe it looks like the internet getting shut down where you're trying to organize. It looks like trolls trying to harass you off the internet. Um, it looks like wondering if you're being spied on. This is a Chicago PD police truck um, with a mobile phone antenna on it. And one of the things that happens when you're organizing is you wonder if your text messages are going to go through without getting intercepted. Um, it also looks like wondering if the social media activity that you've been doing to stay in touch with friends and family and to laugh about things is going to somehow be used against you at a border. So um, it also looks like dragnet surveillance. As, um, as Snowden revealed to us when we, when we learned about the prison program, um, there's massive dragnet surveillance it's, that's, um, that's managed by the NSA. Um, but if you, if you know about history, you know that this wasn't new. Um, and this slide is an article about the FBI's COINTELPRO program from the 60s and 70s, which before the internet was a similar spying program that allowed the FBI to spy on the anti-war movement and the black power movement. So these issues about security that I've talked about actually aren't new at all. They're, um, they're historical, and they're not located in a specific place. This isn't a story about the US. This happens anywhere. It's also not about a specific movement. It's just what happens when people organize to shift power. It's one of the ways now that power responds and tries to prevent them from doing this. So then, um, so how do, we, how do we make progress? Well, um, I'm going to share with you how we can apply strategies of activism to shift the way we think about digital security so that it's not about putting out fire after fire, which is, um, which is just a resource losing activity, um, and turning, turning the way we approach digital security into building collective power. The way we do that is we start by aligning with the values and vision of the activists we're working with. So, um, so a sort of traditional digital security process starts with thinking about risk and protecting data um, but when we work with activists, we think about the values of the activists and we design all of the strategies towards the end, the end goal of their vision. For instance, the Kairos Fellowship, which works with organizers of color and, um, and places them with, with host organizations like Daily Coast, like Move On, like Sierra Club, who have giant online organizing wings. Um, the Kairos Fellowship is trying to shift the, the, um, the ways that people of color get to show up online, get to show up in online organizing to make decisions about who gets reached and how, and how tools get designed. So when we design digital security strategies together with fellows, we center those organizers of color. We ask questions about, oh, if my online blog continues to receive anti-black racist comments, um, when we address this in our organization, can we think about this from a racial justice lens? Can we ask first, does this impact black people and organizers of color differently than, than the white people on staff. And then we design strategies around that. Um, the second thing is to center people. So you always start with lived experience. Um, activists are experts in their communities. They're experts in, pol in politics. And they're not necessarily also um, experts in technology. And that's just fine. Um, if you talk to activists, they will tell you stories about digital security issues that they have, or they will ask questions. Why did my website go down? Why did my Facebook account get taken down? Um, and that's the place where you start. You start there because it lets you focus on things that are actually happening and use the limited resources that you have um, to address issues wisely, and also because it allows the activists to be experts. Um, Another thing we do centering people is we address individual well-being. 
Um, so 18 Million Rising is an online organizing group. They organize across the Asian American diaspora. Um, and they do all of their organizing online. I mean, they have in-person things, but, um, but they, they run campaigns online and they build community online. And so when, when activists and leaders in 18 Million Rising get harassed online, um, 18 Million Rising asks, how can we support those individuals? How can we ask those individuals what the impact on their lives is, what the impact um, on not just their work, but their well-being? And how can we design strategies to support people if they need to take a break, um, or if they need people to show up en masse um, online? A third way that we center people is by addressing community well-being. Um, so this is an image of Detention Watch Network. They're a, they're a national network of organizations that are organizing against the detention system in, in the US. Uh, they organize a lot of actions outside of detention centers in DC, et cetera. Uh, and they, have, they do a lot of organizing digitally. They, have, they, have tool, they use tools like we do, <laughs> email lists, Facebook groups, and they think a lot about, about being careful about how they create those spaces. They think of those spaces as community spaces, and so they send messages on the email list saying, this isn't a private list, please share this and not this, and they're very careful about telling people why and teaching people. Similarly, in, in their Facebook spaces, they understand that it's their own community space and, and have community agreements about hate speech and about respecting each other. The third strategy I want to share is to change systems. So, um, there are infinite numbers of ways to change systems. <laughs> I'm going to share three. Um, and I think that changing systems is the piece where most people in this room can, can have an impact on this issue for activists. Um, so the first way that we change systems is simply by building capacity, by looking at the fact that, um, that there are a lot of people now on the front lines of receiving questions and, um, and needing to be providers of information about privacy and security. For instance, um, a project that we did, the Data Privacy Project, which was a collaboration with Data and Society as well as Brooklyn Public Library, um, Metropolitan New York Library Council, and um, New America, was a program in which um, we, we understood that, you know, Brooklyn Public Library is the biggest provider of free internet in Brooklyn. And this is, this is a situation that's true in many public libraries in many places of the world at this point. So libraries and library staff need to become knowledgeable about privacy and security. So knowing that, we built capacity in that space. Um, we built a team of trainers. We trained over 400 library staff um, to become knowledgeable in privacy and security, to be able to answer questions for patrons. And, and we know that the public library systems in New York serve over 22,000 patrons. Um, a, another way to change systems is to think about who gets to make decisions and to enable more people to be part of decision making. Another project um, that I want to talk about is the Stronger New York City's Community Program, um, which was a collaboration with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and the Mayor's Office of the Chief Technology Officer, um, and it was sponsored by Mozilla Foundation. <clears throat> in, in this project, we worked with um, 16 organizations, all of which do immigration service work in, in New York. So the mayor's office was asking questions about how can we be a digital sanctuary city if we were trying to be a sanctuary city? And one of their thoughts was, well, we need to help the organizations that are doing immigration work understand digital security better. So this is how we built capacity. We, team, um, we trained a team of 10 trainers, 16 organizations, um, 20 individuals from like uh, all of those 16 orgs. Um, and, and we know that those organizations serve thousands, and so, so the impact has, um, so the impact is uh, multiplied. And another, the, my final way to change systems, my suggestion is do it yourself. Um, this is an image from Kefir, which is a feminist collective located in Central America. They provide um, services like email, web hosting um, for movement. Our organizations, and they also do a lot of training. They, um, they take their members along with them as they make new decisions about privacy policies, as they, as they build new infrastructure. Um, and finally, I just want to share um, this statement that came out of a, um, a, a meetup that I was a part of um, in May last year at the Highlander Center in Tennessee. Um, I gathered together with 50 movement techies, so people like myself who think of themselves as activists and technologists. 
Um, 90% of us were people of color, which is sort of unheard of. Um, and, and it let us ask questions in really different ways about what is the way forward. Um, so there's a, there's a larger statement, and there's a link in the slides if you're interested. Um, but, but basically, we realized that we need to approach technology really differently. We need to approach the way that we think about technology and technologists differently. Um, so I just wanted to summarize that I shared three strategies for transforming digital security into collective power. Um, those are always start with values and vision and align any strategy with that. Center people. Um, start with lived experience and allow people to be the experts in their own lives. Address individual well-being and community well-being. And finally, change the system. Uh. <laughs> Thank you. I, I also just wanted to say thank you to Data and Society, everybody who works here and runs this amazing place. Um, and thanks to the fellows and the researchers for sharing all your ideas and changing mine. Hello. Thank you so much, Bex. There's going to be a lot of overlap in our presentation, with the exception that uh, mine is more centered towards how do we think uh, more self-reflectively about our own complicity within the technologies that we criticize. But before we proceed, I too want to... Oh? <laughs> Technologist. <laughs> hmm? I'm proud of this. Oh, that's me. OK. Whoa. It went there too quickly. OK, so uh, I would like to take uh, start at the note that um, Bax has ended in by thanking uh, that and society for taking me in with, uh, along with many of my ideas, which don't always end on an upward note or a set of strategies, and then for sticking with me as I grappled with the US office immigration issues, and in particular to Audrey and Seth and CG and uh, Rigo and Janet and everyone else I'm forgetting for making my transa transition into New York City, which can be brutal, very, very smooth. I have, it's been, however short, this has been transformational, and I am going to treasure the friends and colleagues that I have made here in this time. So today I would like to, it's, it's an oxymoron because I'm really terrified to speak about fear, <laughs> actually. <laughs> but maybe that's how it's supposed to be done. So today I would like to, um, outline briefly why paranoia, however methodical, and anxiety embedded in so many of our current social and cultural techno discourses um, on surveillance, fake news, and uh, platform capitalism more broadly may not be so conducive to uh, different technologies in the future. And then uh, to conclude, I will speak more about speculative and auxiliary practices we can perhaps assume or contemplate uh, in form of games in order to reintroduce the complexity necessary to think about how to operate within this global surveillance regimes as each individual user. So again, this is very much self-reflectively centered. I'm not saying that someone should adopt it. I'm just saying this is how we think about it for each and every one of us. So I do want to talk about fear because this is something that I've been breaking up and uh, focused on a lot in my own practice and trying to understand how um, new alliances between states and corporations and media um, uh, centered around data hoarding are, uh, are sort of generating this new large big complete misunderstood spaces and how we can break them up and understand them a little bit better but also because I found out that this fear and anxiety resonates a lot with many of my colleagues when I mention it in simpler terms people no longer want to hear about hygiene of the internet exclusively and how we constantly have to lock our doors and protect ourselves it's just not a natural way of being so as far as survival goes it's necessary, but as far as living beyond survival and and uh, and breathing freely and being creative, it might not necessarily be conducive. So, I guess my art and research is has two parallel, occasionally overlapping paths, and one is the counter forensic investigation that is the uh, trying to map up the new sovereignties. Um, 
produced by the global surveillance expansion of the global surveillance industry because I don't feel like we're um, addressing that as much as a global phenomena and as a global new uh, sort of consort of power. And the second is uh, working collaboratively with number of philosophers and other artists, technologists and media professionals and anyone who want to collaborate really on speculative future oriented um, proposals and art projects that are informed by investigation. So let me very quickly summarize um, the former in order to give you a good premise for um, the futures that I want to speak about. Uh, so I've been focusing on the way companies, for some time now, for many years before that in society, I've been focused on the way uh, companies consolidate power in particular, and the way this is sort of misrepresented in, the, in, misrepresented in the media and our responses, which is still confined by locality and particular events and sort of putting pre precise villains on a spotlight such as Musk or Bezos or Zuckerberg, not to say that those people are great, they aren't, they're terrible. Uh, but it's not just, if it only was that easy, it's very easy to sort of uh, um, get righteously indignated over Bezos, he invites all the hates you can master, but then as soon as I'm, we talk about how much more complex it is and how we are all involved in some of these processes, many people are just going, oh, I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not feeling for this today, let's, let's go back to that other, hating that other guy, <laughs> it's much easier. You know. So, and usually this work is presented in this giant large-scale site-specific installation where I mix documents and audio files and images and text in a way that help you walk through it and maybe see some of the connections that weren't previously made immediately apparent in our existing mainstream discourses on surveillance. But since we don't really have time to or space to host an exhibition in New York, I will give you like what it would look like. So here is what surveillance complex look like as an industry. Um, uh, in a few seconds, around the globe. All around the world. And all of these uh, companies that know each other and state officials that know and collaborate between each other. This is Uzbekistan transaction. And uh, you can see more of, uh, uh, more of the text around these issues on my website. And here is usually what uh, surveillance business sounds like. Can you read? Is it visible? I'll summarize it. It just, I wanted to um, go back. There was this favorite one, li one last slide that uh, sort of the customers write back to surveillance companies. Most of it is not working and there is a lot of swearing and dead jokes going on and uh, it's all very banal and, and kind of unsophisticated. And just to, for a good effect, to focus a little bit on the traditional customers of surveillance and big data companies are usually existing governments, but I would like to play just this one audio of other sort of more auxiliary customers which represent the internet, in this case the interests of US and and British uh, governments, and then purchase these technologies from companies like Variant Israel in order to uh, use them on existing governments in, say, Global South or in Middle East, and then uh, uh, help the revolutionaries install new governments, and then continue to use the surveillance uh, tools in order to have these governments be more compliant with the US foreign policy. So just in their own words. Just a very quick, let's see. This is an experiment, if it doesn't work, I try. Is that it? You could call us, we call ourselves, as a joke, uh, you know, the, the shop toys are us, we call ourselves revolutions are us. <laughs> we, we are probably the most active law firm in the world when it comes to <coughs> working with revolutions. Uh, we are currently working on on DRC with Christian, we work with Somaliland, Somalia, Somaliland. We work with Syria. Uh, we work with Ethiopia. We are, etc., uh, etc. Et we have uh, our engagement in Africa come, goes back to. We did a peace process in Darfur, our firm. We did a peace process in Libya, not so successful. 
but uh, we tried. Uh, we were not involved in Iraq and Afghanistan. We work in Pakistan. We work on Iran, uh, etc., etc. Um, most revolutions that are brewing in the world, we are some, to some extent involved in. Most armed opposition groups and non-armed opposition groups are people that we meet frequently with. So yeah, this is just a, a law firm, very Western, very white law firm that marks, um, masks itself as something that uses surveillance to do to buy activist causes. So basically, this guy and Bex are we're like we're the same people. They're just here to help you. Um, so yeah, this is. Um, this brings me to my overarching points, which I would get to making as soon as I figure out how this works. There we go. Right. So to proceed to some of the takeaway points, I guess, this is really vastly oversimplified. The relationship between Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, Huawei, Telesonera, Siemens, to name a few, Verint Israel, uh, are not, and this sort of the way we read the, about them in conjunction with elections, are not a deviation from a norm. It is the norm. Uh, or as the CEO of Hacking Team uh, said to me during our interview in Milan, we don't do business in North Korea, and this is our motto. So everyone else at any other time is totally cool. And um, I think this is um, this norm is interesting because uh, to speak and think about it longer because it is relying on our collective normativity in order to be accepted as such. And I think uh, it's something that is important to think about because uh, we complement very often the Swedish example in uh, in terms of uh, progress of the defense of the user data, but um, the democracy in Sweden doesn't really matter so much as long as Swedish telecoms are still accepting tender contracts from national security services that are confirmed to boil people alive. These things will still come back to us. It's only as democratic as it is globally democratic. It doesn't matter how good you perform in your local sphere. So we need to think about this as something without perhaps example. And this is difficult, but we get to that, I guess, as to how. Secondary, secondly, excuse me. Um, not the transaction that I'm describing, the c uh, contracts that occur within these environments may be secret, but the ecosystems and the sort of the property and, and the number of people that are involved with them are not secret. And I think by looking at these ecosystems or let's say the, the metadata around the secret events and by correlating them with what else is going on at that time around the world, on a global scale as well as locally, will give us a very good estimate as to what happens in those contracts. So just saying that everything is secret and we don't know is, is a diversion, I think. We can very well figure it out, what's up, by knowing all the other um, properties of a certain event. And in fact, some of this could be predicted. And this is, I'm going to get to our fun part now. So just to make an example, one of the projects that I run here um, is uh, in the wake of Cambridge Analytica, I decided to um, remix a bunch of slogans from uh, Messina Group, Cambridge Analytica, and uh, other uh, data-centric political consultancies and designed together with my friend Sam Levine, who is on the back here, a mock-up website for a mock-up company that is basically like another Cambridge Analytica, and it, it looks very um, unsophisticated, should we say. It's just the front that is using a lot of, of the same slogans that just looks exactly like that company. And then I run a, an ad in popular uh, job application platforms, um, inviting people to apply as the head of big data campaign for the upcoming 2019 Nigerian elections and with the future for uh, having more jobs in sort of mingling with the elections in the global south. It was a very sophisticated live written ad, but ultimately it says, could you care help come over and help us fuck with the elections in Nigeria? Please bleep that. 
So I thought no one, no one is going to co respond to that. It's like Guardian and New York Times writing about Cambridge Analytica all the time, and like the journalists are going to out me in 15 minutes, and it will all be very over, and the world is a great place. And I run this ads uh, specifically in London and in DC, where people read and they depend for their job on such media, so that it could be over with quickly, and I will sort of have this renewed, rejuvenated sense in, in us being very, very informed and better people because, you know, hacking elections has become uncool in 2018. Well, I was wrong, <laughs> so wrong. Here is just a list of, um, each one of these represents, I think, a worthy candidate. And here is a byline from all of the bios. And I think I've selected specifically, so um, none of the fortune trolls, none of the fascists, really, more like kind of the people we would hang out with. And I, you know, I don't know what TED speaker blockchain evangelist means, but I guess, you know. <laughs> uh, funny, but I mean, <laughs> also very, very depressing in the sense that we can't possibly argue that any of these individuals have not gotten the memo. And I think we need to find a way to focus and address the duality of both accepting that Cambridge Analytica and Facebook suck, but at the same time looking for a job in a company that is just like this and being ready to fly over to Nigeria and use social media to make people's life somewhere else very, very miserable. So I don't know how we do it, but somehow, I mean, I understand that it's a job and everyone works for money, but somehow when people steal from shops because they need money, we call them criminals. And when they take money from Nigerian dictators uh, and accept this sort of jobs, we call them business oriented and market adaptable, um, highly qualified professionals. So, um, uh, I'm s unfortunately, I can't show the entire company uh, structure yet in the full ads, but uh, just to sort of promote this, uh, because it's an ongoing experiment, and I would like to see more of what people would be proposing as a strategy for Nigeria, and maybe distract them from actually hacking the Nigerian elections in the meantime. Uh, but uh, I would be running a series of, of text pieces on this and revealing the website as well, so if you do want to uh, publish this or get engaged, please um, get in touch. So to come back to number three again. Um, however complicated the systems are, they're not necessarily very complex. And I think in that non-complexity, they rely very much on... Um, they're very similar in the way we try to simplify the way we interact and think about technology. And I want to spend the last few minutes on thinking about how we can maybe make ourselves a little bit uh, less useful by stepping away from uh, uh, producing fairly straightforward forms of digital activism, uh, which sometimes reliant on tools uh, and on liking your doors and buying user technologies to thinking about technology outside of its value as a tool or outside of its value as a property and something that we are architects of. And by architects, I don't only mean as someone that writes code, but architects as in we think about what kind of technology could be possible. And to conclude on something more specific, this is a project that I have developed that I would like to invite everyone who is interested in this team to participate on. It's called Speculative Media Lab. It's a prototype uh, mediascape uh, designed for collective play through which artists, journalists, and technologists and other media professionals can foster media practice that counters algorithmically driven production of network content. Uh, which is often the kind of production that becomes a profit driver for many of the surveillance companies that we have around the world. 
Uh, using a set of specific uh, purpose-based technologies, this project uh, will download the entirety of the internet production uh, that is meant to communicate something to someone uh, in a, from within a very, very narrow time frame. And by narrow, I mean we're talking about fraction of a second here. It will then again use code to scrap some of the key social constructs that made uh, this online content very profitable for algorithms such as gender, nationality, ethnicity, political affiliation, and so forth. And then uh, the lab is inviting a number of participants to, to, in real time, try to make sense of the archive or what's left of the archive, archive and try to recontextualize it um, using categories that go beyond the normative and existing um, editorial conventions and beyond the current uh, forms of algorithmic sorting. And I hope that this and some of the other projects that I'm working on, which I unfortunately won't have to time anymore to go into, will um, inspire us to think a little bit about how we are all very much part of this surveillance machine, but also how we can perhaps consider forming more playful, uh, less neoliberal media practices uh, right within it or nested within it and, and go undetected while also making ourselves a little bit um, less useful or rather more useless uh, to the surveillance mechanisms and these sovereignties. Thank you so much. Hey, hi, is this on? We're gonna move to Q&A now. Hi, I'm Audrey Evans. I'm the Interim Director of Programs here at Data and Society, and I would love to open up the floor to questions if anyone has a question. Please raise your hand. Madeline. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Bex, actually. Um, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, let's see, yeah. I'm sort of piggybacking on some conversations that I think we've both been a part of, but I'm, I'm, wor I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about the language of security and um, if, if that's something that like in your work with activists you wanna, you wanna sort of hold onto and reconfigure into power or if you wanna actually like move away from the language of security with its sort of weighted militaristic um, Origins, not origins, but orientations. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Was it working? Oh. <laughs> um, thanks, Madeline. Yeah, so um, let's see. So when I work with people who are peace activists, like Women Cross DMZ, uh, we don't, yeah, mm -hmm. they're, they're challenging security apparatuses globally. Um, and so, so we think about digital security in, a di in different terms. Yeah, we think about it more as like safety or um, or really is just as a way of enabling those visions and values um, to come to pass. And I think um, I have, in my practice, been moving away from working with people to define specific digital security strategies, um, which was sort of where I started, was working with activists to come up with digital security policies, how we use email, how we don't, how we set passwords, that kind of thing, et cetera. Um, and I've been moving more towards working with people to integrate that into whatever else they do. So maybe it gets integrated into the way that um, an organization um, manages their technology. Or maybe it just gets integrated into the way that an organization defines how they organize and um, strategize around an online campaign. So like it's just another campaigning strategy. We think about, we think about whether or not this thing could lead towards harassment and what we're going to do about it. Hello, uh, um, I guess this is on. Uh, uh, I guess uh, your Bex. Uh, I guess this one's. I guess for you, you as well. Um, um, uh, you, 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 are mentioning that 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 the the activists don't always. Um, they understand their communities, but they don't necessarily understand the technology. Um, if you were gonna, if you were gonna, if you were gonna um, redesign a system system to to to. 
educates critics, how would you how would you do that? Like a, a, a system that automatically trains the next generation of people who are going to overthrow throw the system? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I'll answer the first part <laughs> about, um, I, I didn't mean to say that activists aren't experts in technology, just that the, when you start talking to people about digital security, people who think of themselves as hackers and digital security nerds get super technical. There are a lot of terms, there are a lot of tools out there, um, and the, it's a very small number of people in the world who've had the time and the privilege or the, the um, orientation towards understanding what they are and how to use them. Um, and so it can become very alienating for any normal person um, to start talking to people about digital security. And so um, what I was suggesting is that the best way to talk about digital security and nearly anything technical is to ask people to tell you stories. You know, just like maybe you ask your parent to tell you the story of why they couldn't receive your group text um, and then you work through the problem. Uh, you can also ask activists, like, what did you experience? So thank you both for your, uh, your work in the world. Um, so the next question is for both of you. Uh, I think what's great seeing your work side by side is um, really about the overlaps and the dissimilarities. And it, you know, it feels like, in one respect, uh, Bex, uh, that your work has this like, very imminently practical uh, orientation. And Mari, you're engaged in sort of this artistic praxis that even in your own words, sometimes you're like, oh, how do we be less useful? And I'm curious about your, how you guys think about uh, either the complementarity of those two perspectives, if they, you see them in, so, as complementary, and where there are different you know, divergences in terms of like what they can accomplish differently in the world. And I know that's not an easy, uh, and there might be a lot of assumptions I just made, but oh, give it a go. <laughs> I don't know. I find that it's a little bit preposterous for me to speak about usability of art, or uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think uh, um, there is a lot of discourses into uh, digital activism because they are useful to someone, and this is fine. I'm not saying seize all activity, sit under a tree, and just like contemplate, spend the rest of your time contemplating. Nothing is wrong with that either. But I feel like uh, the role of art now, which is quickly vanishing and disappearing more and more, is maybe to use that window to reintroduce some of the complexities because we speak with so much certainty about value, uh, usefulness of technologies while still uh, only s looking at them as tools with very limited proprietary power. And I think uh, this window is closing up very quickly, but we need to sometimes, in some form or another, to return to complexities and stay in this ambiguity, because I think these complexities are precisely something that is equally threatening, not only to ourselves, but to the larger um, powers that be. And uh, these complexities makes us less algorithmically compliant and less of commodities ourselves. Um, yeah, I think our work is really complementary. I think um, if you if you let us talk for even longer, we would <laughs> we would get to a place where we ch we talked about how like how much shared vision we actually have. Um, I I believe that the way that Mari approaches the work of uncovering surveillance systems and the way that these things are globally linked and um, um, and are being used like in coordinated ways um, around yeah around the world through time uh, can only help us to shift the ways that surveillance is brought to bear on, on activists and movements. <laughs> Sorry, my, I meant it. Hi, thank you very much. This is a question for Mari. Uh, I'm curious, so a lot of the presentation seems to suggest that like something about the technology is fundamentally bad. Um, and I'm not sure I agree with that prospect, so like surveillance has a negative connotation to it, but we use a lot of these kind of technologies and they can be used in pro-social ways. So I'm curious how you like 
balance the pro-social versus the anti-social aspects of, of the technology? I'm not saying technology is fundamentally anything. I'm saying humans are fundamentally not as good as we may be thinking about them. I'm saying that we should sometimes take a moment to be more self-reflective and critical of what we think of good and bad social practices because they are not as different or binary as we often led to believe. And technologies are, I don't know if they're bad, I find that them to be very unified as tools, and this is very limited way of looking at what technology is and can be as tools, and as tools that exist within neoliberal media for profit economy. There is very little technology that isn't situated around making profit, and it might be a great time to come back again thinking about technology in that way. So whether technology is evil, God forbid, I'm, I'm a cyber. I mean. <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think technology is evil. I think technology is inevitable, and I think we are actually more and more transmimetic between human and technology. So there is no uh, way with which I would say oh, let's just forget computers. No. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Maria, question for you. Um, I wanted to uh, know a little bit more about what you meant by militaristic um, surveillance culture. Um, you use that to contrast uh, it being sophisticated. Wanted to hear a little more about that. And I also wanted to hear a little bit more about what kind of morality you might have expected uh, from the applicants, if any. Uh, I don't expect morality, but I would like to form some in myself or in ourselves. I'm not, I'm, I just want to shift the focus from the other because it's so easy again to come over and be like, I want to criticize that guy over there. He has a lot of money and he's responsible for everything. Yeah, but, you know, we all live in this bubble and occupy the same spaces. So what I meant by militaristic is actually it's not sophisticated or terrifying or very intelligent. Most of the technologies that build as tools for profit are pretty stupid, and the people who build them just doing their job. So within this, there is an opportunity to occupy, however all-encompassing the space of surveillance is, within this, there is an opportunity to, again, return to complexities and occupy spaces in which um, we can... Uh, sort of troll these systems quite easily uh, through play and through just letting ourselves think outside of just tools. And uh, I think it's a good response to, uh, for example, security tools which we have uh, or traditional forms of activism because both of these are already embodied in the market um, systems of the overall surveillance global complex. While like making ourselves less predictable and less functional is something that is is a very fairly uncomplicated way to make very automated and supposedly complex, although not, but militarized. They're scary not because they're complex. They're scary because uh, it it has the potential to kill people. Right. So and uh, uh, but there is also an opportunity within the fact that they're actually quite banal. Right. I hope that helps. <laughs> Um, a little. I've got more, but okay. later. We can talk afterward. Okay, I think we have time for one final question. Over here. Thank you. This question is for Mari. Um, I find it really refreshing that your practice makes space beyond this paradigm of investigations, which has almost become the next solutions buzzword as the transatlantic art industry dives to catch the remnants of the fourth estate. Um, can you talk a bit more about how you might work in the future to access and activate this territory of knowledge that you talk about in your second column as being not necessarily investigation, sort of knowledge that we all sort of know together collectively and can access about who these global data brokers are, who these power actors are, and that you imply has almost an intuitive element that does not absolutely require so-called investigative approaches? That's a lot of work to map all of this into universally accessible knowledge for like high school level. I don't know, but I think um, part of it maybe would be to look around in places that you go past every day and see how these processes are connected to other, or to look for the way uh, roots of, of different things are connected beyond uh, the explanations that you already have. So, I mean, 
we need a different word for that, but I would say I would almost encourage sort of this schizophrenic approach of looking at, say, fake news and saying, okay, suppose you say that part of it is true. Let me, let me imagine that I believe you. Maybe some of it is true, it's just more complex. What happens if we talk about the part of it that it is true? What if we try to, for the sake of experiment, follow a different route and figuring out how it might be true rather than proving that it's all false and what we could learn along the way? But uh, how would you uh, educate across all fields is, uh, I don't know, engage in more collaborative trans, uh, trans uh, departmental project and hang out with activists and uh, go and, I mean, a lot of my practice is performative. As an artist, I go into these uh, places where you don't expect an artist because I think on some micro level, your presence changes that space a little bit. And uh, if we uh, try to mix and remix a little bit different disciplines, then we can inform each other. And if we can ask and learn, I learn a lot about surveillance and uh, thinking about surveillance or explaining how it's, global by uh, borrowing from uh, architects and architectural theory and uh, models like cons um, continuous monument, which was once um, uh, a sort of positive representation of technology uh, back in, um, uh, in Gibson days. And now it become a, a, a much more charged and negative connotation of surveillance. Uh, but beyond this, um, I will have to think about this and get back to you in a year or a decade. <laughs> <laughs> but I promise I will think about it. <laughs> All right. I think, I think we're going to wrap it up here at this point. But that doesn't mean that you can't continue to ask questions, because we're about to turn this space into a place to play together, <laughs> as Mari has taught me a lot about how to play and be creative and thinking about a lot of these big questions. Thank you both so much, Mari and Bex. Thank you.